Hello everybody, welcome back to another movie review. Today we'll be discussing War Dogs. Just watched it on Hulu. I had seen this one when it came out. It was originally released in 2016. I remember liking it, but not remembering the whole plot. Um, so you know the normal thing. I'll give you my, I will read the overview as written by the producers or writers or whoever released the piece. And I'll be giving you my overall impressions and grade. And after that, if you've not seen the movie and would like to based or not based on my recommendation, you're going to want to turn off the video because there will be spoiler alerts. We'll be discussing the plot, synopsis, and character development. Um, similar movies, major themes. Oh, one major theme is kind of unique to this one. I don't think we've covered it all. Just the morality of gun running. But here we have the overview. It is... With the war in Iraq raging on, a young man, Jonah Hill, offers his childhood friend a chance to make big bucks by becoming an international arms dealer. Together, they exploit a government initiative that allows businesses to bid on U.S. military contracts. Starting small allows the duo to rake in money and live the high life. They soon find themselves in over their heads after landing a $300 million deal to supply Afghan forces, a deal that puts them in business with some very shady people. Released on August 19, 2016, directed by Todd Phillips. Box office of 86.2 millis on a budget of 50 millis. Sounds like we made a profit on that one. <coughs> but we have Jonah Hill in here, we have Miles Teller and Ana de Armas, as well as Dan Bilzerian, super minor role. I mean, all, all well known people. And Bradley Cooper as well, excuse me. But, so overall impressions, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really, I thought the, again, the genre is war slash comedy, and typically for like serious movies, I like them to be like not like comedy. Is this one really worked for me? I thought Jonah Hill did an absolute fantastic job as Ephraim Devaroli, <laughs> Devaroli or something, but Ephraim is what they call him in the movie. So I thought his character and writing throughout was just absolutely superb. Um, I thought the action and development was super interesting, and well, this is supposed to be based on and I didn't. I didn't look into the validity of how rigorous or how close to the, a real story this was, but it was kind of based on a real story. And so, again, anything with a history background, again, just for the plot development, simply being real always has my interest peaked more so than just a completely fictional story that I have to get into the plot. And so, thoroughly enjoyed it. The, the, just the, the delivery and characterization of Ephraim is absolutely superb. Anna Diarmas is nice to look at. Um, the plot, the action, the comedy, it really, really worked for me. So I'm just gonna give it a solid A. And so I don't know why I see on, on here we have like, what are they, 82% of Google users liked it, 57% on Metacritic, 61% of Rotten Tomatoes, and 7.1 out of 10 on IMBD. They're all wrong, this is a super good one. So get a lot of raunchy humor, but the, the humor based with the story, based with the characterizations, I thought was superb. So solid, solid A for War Dogs overall. So if you've not seen the movie and would like to base off that recommendation, you're going to shut off the video now. So you open up and you have um, David Pakus. He is a he is a massage dude. So he's given some massage. You get some narration. This happens in like the Iraq War. So I think it's like you get some most of it. I think it's 2008, 2007. But you get some flashbacks like 2005. But David is giving some massages to some old dudes. He's, he's making 75 bucks an hour in Miami Beach, massaging rich people. It, it, the opening scene is like him massaging this dude, and the dude like throws his towel off, and it's like, oops, it fell down. <laughs> David's like, yeah, okay, okay, so, sorry, Bill. <laughs> so he's not too, he's not ha liking the uh, massaging the old dudes too much. So he sinks his life savings into a bunch of um, bed sheets. He's going to shit the cell. He's got the 400 thread count. Uh, Turkish blinnens or something, but he's gonna sell a uh, bulk, uh, buy in bulk bed sheets and sell them to uh, nursing homes. So he goes to one. What they show one scene of him trying to sell it's not going so well, but then but then somebody dies, and so after somebody dies, David goes to a um, into a funeral, and so he he's either married or his girlfriend is the Ana de Armas character. They're together at the beginning. She's definitely cute to look at, um, but regardless, somebody they know mutually dies, and he's married to her girlfriend. That's his girlfriend, and she's got a friend, Rosen, and her and his wife is also plays a minor role as well. She's got her friend group. Ephraim's kind of talking with um, Rosen at this funeral, 
and they're like, is that, or David and Rosen are talking, and they're like, is that Ephraim? And I guess Ephraim and David hadn't seen each other since like sophomore year in high school or something. And so Ephraim has come back. He's now a successful arms dealer with his father in Miami. But basically what the scheme is, is just, I guess, I guess some, again, I'm looking to the bullet, I'm certain it was historically accurate, but what the actual historical, um, something was about bidding on contracts or it was like, wasn't fair practice or something. So uh, the, the business model is Ephraim just digs through uh, all of these public military contracts and finds the, the crumbs, the little, the little contracts, the big defense contractors want to go after and tries to, you know, he has this AEY business, which is just him and his dad trying to basically sell guns without ever seeing the guns, just, just arranging the pieces. And so that's really what he's doing. But he, they come back at this funeral, and they, um, after the funeral, he tells David to cancel his, his uh, afternoon plans, and we're going to, you know, go by the office or just hang out with the boys back in town. And so David cancels his uh, thread count uh, <laughs> meeting and goes with Ephraim to go buy some weed. And so they go to this dude, and Ephraim, played by Jonah Hill, Jonah Hill's still pretty rather large in this one, <laughs> but he's, he just the, the presentation of the character was fantastic. And so he's, he's all dressed up in this nice suit, and he's going down to the hood, and he's an arms dealer, he's going to go buy some weeds, knocking on this apartment, and nobody's answering, and a bunch of gangbangers are sitting around, and, and then they're black, and he's white, and you know, they're the tough guys, and he, he's the white boy in the hood. And you know, they're like, we'll sell you some weed, so he gives them 300 bucks for an ounce, and he's like, that's a good deal, that's, that's extremely expensive. <laughs> but uh, like back in the day, I don't know, I wasn't smoking or selling in 2008. <laughs> but regarding and in Miami Beach, let alone. But I have, I have heard you retail pounds down there for over five grand, which is solid, <laughs> beyond solid. But regardless, the dudes, the dudes literally just like Ephraim gives him the money, puts it in his pocket, and literally immediately acts like nothing happened. He's like, "What do you What do you want? Get out of here!" And Ephraim's like, "Okay, man." And he goes back into the back of his trunk, pulls out some like Mac or something, and starts spraying shit in the air. And the gangbangers run away. And David's like, bro, what are you doing? He's like, be, be careful. It's, it's all right, man. Um, I got a class three firearms license. So I'm not sure what that is, but I'm sure it doesn't allow you to open fire in the street. <laughs> and so that's, I'm sure that wasn't historically accurate, but it's a, certainly a fucking richly funny scene. And so the, the Ephraim's like, the, they kick it for the day. David comes back stoned out of his mind, and he's going to meet up with Ephraim, come by the office the next day and just see what's going on. Goes by the office next day and sees Ephraim closing a deal. Ephraim has has an investor. He also tells David, which is a is a relative uh, a relevant plot development. He also tells David, you know, he's back for the funeral for to not really for the funeral, but just to see the old people. Hopefully, run into David, and then his dad had ripped or his uncle or his dad. I think it was his uncle, but whoever his business partner was before um, was that had stolen had stolen seventy thousand dollars from him. And so David sees Ephraim closing a deal, and he sees Ephraim, you know, if he's talking to a Christian, he's the good Christian boy. His investor, Ralph Slutsky, is Jewish, so whenever he's with Ralph, he's wearing a yarmulke. And so he just, he just plays whatever he wants to, you know, get, get to where he wants to go, and the character agent is just awesome. But, so David sees him close a deal, um, and then he's like, Ephraim's like, you know, come work for me, I've been looking for to take somebody on, and David's like, I don't know, I don't know. But he ends up doing so. He's kind of against them. Um, him is his girlfriend or wife is, is really against the war, and David's also kind of against the war. But Ephraim is just like you know the war is going on anyway, so why why not make some money off of it? Which is really the only major theme is just if there's a war going on, is it what's the morality of making money off of it? I don't I don't fucking know. <laughs> I don't know. I would probably try to make some money to be fucking honest, but. Regardless, David, after a little moral rationaling, decides to go with it and starts and starts to lie a little bit to Iz about what they're doing. And so they start, they get this, um, Ephraim shows David how to search through the contracts and they get this, um, this Beretta deal where they have to ship some um, Italian Berettas to um, Iraq to uh, Captain Phillips. And so there's a... Um, they're at a, they're at, Iz is having a house party, like a dinner party with her friends, which includes Rosen and Rosen's wife. Um, Ephraim's not there, David is there, at which point Rosen, or Rosen's wife said that the reason Ephraim was back, or that 
the story you told David was the wrong story. Well, she says first that um, Ephraim stole 70000 from um, his uncle, and then uh, David says that he heard the exact opposite. But later in the movie, it, de it develops that Ephraim was probably one of those jibbing people out of money. And so, regardless, um, Ephraim comes to the dinner party, like, knock, 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 because that, they've gotten this Beretta contract, and then he's like, you know, kind of talking to David outside. So David and Ephraim are outside. Uh, uh, Captain Phillips calls him right then, and they're talking about how there's some new embargo out of Italy where you can't ship from Italy to Iraq. And so they're having this big blow up about, you know, losing this $300,000 profit. And for David, that'd be like 180000 or whatever. Or the, he would have made 180000 I'm not sure what the total profit was. But, but he, the arrangement is 30% for David, 70% for Ephraim. <clears throat> and so, regardless, is here's them arguing outside. He's like, what are you talking about, guns? And so then David, <clears throat> David tells her what's going on. You know, she's mad at him for lying, but pretty much, you know, stays, stays with the family and is fine with it and gets that he's trying to provide for the family. And so they're trying to look for workarounds, and then they, they figure out that there's not much to do besides go down there. And they try to ship them through Jordan. Jordan has them seized, the country of Jordan, and so they have to go down there to figure it out. So they fly down there. They have this little 11-year-old translator, and Ephraim's lines are awesome, absolutely awesome. He's like, you know, at this point, he's asking this... Uh, Jordanian, uh, you know, what do I need to do to get my guns back? And it's just like, you know, as an 11 year old translator, he's like, is this the point where I offer him a gift? And he's like, the kid's like, yes, that's correct. He's like, okay, how about 1400 bucks? And so they get the guns back, but they wanted them shipped. And so they just get the guns, but then they have to like figure out shipping or transportation themselves. And so at that point, they're like, you know, it's, it's only 500 kilometers to Baghdad. Why don't you just drive them? And so Ephraim's like, fuck it, man, we're gun riders, let's run some fucking guns. And so they have this, um, I don't have the driver up here, I to recognize him, but they had, they had a driver that was um, uh, Jordanian or, or uh, Iraqi, no, I'm not, I'm not sure, and I, I can't find uh, who was the driver just off the top of my head. Regardless, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but they basically, they have to drive, and so they go, they're driving, um, Iz calls... Uh, David again, and she's already uh, she's 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 accepted what he's doing, but she really doesn't like the lying part. So David said he's never going to be leaving the uh, the uh, um, the hotel room in Jordan. And so they're driving, and they're stopping at a gas station. David sees a dead body in there. Ephraim's like, of course, bro, it's a war zone. You're gonna see dead bodies, bro. And so their driver is filling up gas, like really run down gas station in the Middle East. Um, but the gas is like free because it's so cheap. <laughs> and so he's literally filling up the gas. Well, I think it's free as in like the, 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 the smuggler says courtesy or part of the service or whatever. But he's filling up in this gas thing like back and then there's there's the, the building and then there's the car. David gets a call from Iz and as they're doing that, Ephraim has gotten out of the car to take a piss and David sees like Taliban or just like, you know, uh, an old 2006 Ford F-150 driving down with three three dudes all dripped out in the, the Afghani things with, with AKs driving and two cars coming. And so now they're they're panicking, um, they're yelling, the they're completely out of gas. So Ephraim tries to start the thing, gets it going, and they start driving away. Their driver's running back with the gas can, barely jumps in the car. They're getting the two two threes are raining down on them. And they must have crossed the border right at the right time or whatever because the, 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 the cars stop after following them for, I don't know, a mile or so. And you see helicopters coming and the American uh, government or uh, milita military mili vehicles driving at the, the Taliban or the insurgents. So they barely make it. They get the guns. They deliver it to Captain Phillips. They get paid, I don't know, two million, three million bucks. Again, they make X amount of dollars. And David, I think, was going to make the 180K. And so... They're happy about it. They take a picture, and Captain Phillips says they drove through the, through the Valley of Death, and it's just you know, funny, funny characterizations learning that they just drove through like the, the Triangle of Death or whatever triangles, and you frame those will go through any triangle, including your mom's. So, so the writing and the humor was just, was just pristine for me on the frame character throughout the whole movie. And so regardless, they get escorted back to the, um, to the States, and um, I guess that deal put them on the map, and now, now their business really starts to flourish. And so the next thing they want to do is they, <clears throat> they see this big, this $100 million or 100 million round of AK-47 ammunition on this contract. And so they're trying to piece together 
um, a, a competitive bid to to get this contract because it's the biggest opportunity they'll get. So they go to this conference in Las Vegas and they realize even if they do get the contract, just sourcing all the different materials and all the different things they need, it is just way over their heads. And so at that time, Henry Girard, who's like the biggest arms dealer in the world or whatever or something, meets with David Pakus and um, he frames in with a prostitute. David's like, no, Henry's down there. Well, Henry accidentally bumps into David at the blackjack table and then wants to meet and says he can help with, the, with their problems. And so David and Ephraim meet down there and they learn that uh, Henry is on a ter terrorist watch list for dealing guns to who knows who, and even though it's a little sketchy effort, it's like, how much money can we make? Okay, we're in. <laughs> and so, once David learns that he's on a terrorist watch list, he's a little iffy, but then Ephraim's like, no, nope, we're, we're doing this contract for sure. And so basically, Henry has Albanian contacts with this old Soviet uh, artillery that had never been used, and can hook up the entire contract through one dude, um, through the Albanians. And so, from that point on, they have to basically they go they go to Albania, check out the the ammunition rounds. They see one box, they fire the guns, and they see that they work. Again, the bullets are rather old, um, but they see that they meet the people. Their driver's name is Matt Bashkim, Bashkim probably. But regardless, Dan Belzeri only plays a minor role. Once they start getting some money or some flow, they're in this club, and Ephraim tries to pick up this girl, and Dan Belzeri punches him in the face. And that's pretty much his only appearance. But regardless, so they come back. They they know they have the the supply with the um, with Henry Gerard, the uh, uh, what was the well known actor? What is his name? Matt 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 something, yeah, or Bradley Cooper, excuse me. But so they they have to now put together a, a, a government contract to win the or govern a proposal to win the government contract. So they just forge literally everything. Just which classic. Forging something to the federal government. That's fucking bold. <laughs> but those always are really out for like that. So regardless, they forge a bunch of shit and then they submit their bid and they wait five weeks and then, um, or five months, and then they get the contract, they go through three audits and then they have an in-person meeting. So they meet with senior officials or whoever's approving this contract at a government building and they're, they're like, the people giving out the contract were like, you know, the Pentagon is like, you know, your bid came in way, way under. And it was like, how, and Ephraim's like, how far under? And they're like, $53 million. So Ephraim has a pretty big breakdown about leaving a lot of money on the table on that one. But regardless, they're still going to make a lot of money and they're going to get it done. So then David has to go back to Albania to start, like, shipping and delivering this stuff. Um, and before he does that, he has Ephraim sign a contract, kind of, you know, as, as a premonition or as like as a consequence from Rosen and Rosen's wife saying that yeah, Ephraim um, was the one stealing money. And at this point, David had seen Ephraim lie about how much money he made when he gives his returns to Ralph. And so Ralph was making good money, but Ephraim was always undercutting him as well. And so the, the deal is, is really pretty much in place. So David is in... And at this point, um, Iz finds the photo that they took at the, the Triangle of Death drop-off place and realizes that David lied about being in the uh, hotel the entire time. So Iz wants to go Iz is going to go stay with her mom, because mainly because David's lying, not because of what he's doing. And so she does that, and David is now going to Albania for a couple weeks or a couple months to get the, sh the shipping of the ammunition. And so when he gets back to Albania, he realizes that there's only one or two crates of Albanian uh, ammunition, and the rest is Chinese. And there's an embargo against China for importing of ammunition from China. So they have this big dilemma of what to do, of trying to, you know, they call it Henry Gerard. He's like, no, that's your problem, brothers. <laughs> and, but they basically decide to, they're going to repackage it, take it out of wooden crates, put it into plastic bags and into paper, cardboard boxes, and save a ton of money on shipping as well. And so Bat Boshkin, the their driver, the Albanian driver, introduces him to um, Enver, who is just another Albanian with some criminal or just people to help. And basically, they do a test run of like how much. So it's a hundred million rounds. You know, they take them to, they time them to see for an hour to see how long it's going to take them to do all of these boxes. And they estimate the price for that only to be a hundred thousand dollars. To which Ephraim and David, they act like they're talking seriously to be able to say that out loud. But the, but the number is extremely low for them, so they're like, yeah, it's, uh, that's, uh, should we go back to the counter? No, no, deal. 
And so basically then the, the Albanians packing and shipping, um, moving, the, moving the ammunition. And so everything, everything's starting to go off without a hitch. Um, Ephraim is in Miami, David is in um, Albania, and then Henry, or one day, uh, basically I forget, but Ephraim wants to cut Henry out of the deal entirely. And so David gets abducted, kidnapped in Albania by Henry. They put a gun to his face. And basically David's like, you know, I'm not cheating you. I'm not cheating you. It was Ephraim or something like that. But they don't shoot him or anything. They just kidnap him, intimidate him. And that's pretty much that. And so basically, yeah, pretty much, I, I, don't, I don't know if they deliver the whole, the whole thing. But after that event, David comes, leaves Albania immediately, goes directly to Ephraim's office, and it was like, you know, I want to buy out. Here's how much we've delivered so far. It's four million bucks. I'll take 40 cents on the dollar. And then Ephraim, that's when he really, really character development, sharp turn of being the best friends, working together to now we're competitive cutthroat business partners against each other. And so Ephraim's like, how about zero cents on the dollar? And David goes back to his desk where he left the contract that they signed, and it's gone. And Ephraim kind of like smiles at him. And so obviously you got to keep seconds on that. You got to get that shit notarized. You got to have backups on that shit. So sloppy, sloppy David, but regardless if that's true or not, I don't know. But anyway, David throws like his like his like uh, golden grenade, which is like just decoration, but like throws it through the gap, glass window and storms out of the office. And so he goes back. He goes back to being a massage, massage therapist for rich dudes. Then Ralph Slutsky comes back and approaches um, um, uh, David after a little bit. And, you know, it's been a month or two months or whatever. And once, when he did leave um, Albania, Enver had never been paid his $100,000. And so, um, once, once David comes back completely, like right when he gets back from Albania, he just goes right to Iz and tells her exactly what's going on, and she, she welcomes him back. And so, basically, after that, um, Ephraim and David, uh, Ephraim offers, like, I think it's like $200,000, $50,000 a year for four years to David, and David's like, are you fucking kidding me? Two hundred thousand dollars, and so they just they you kind of like you know David says you know I I have I have copies of all the forgery which why would you keep the copies of the forgery not copies of the contract, but anyway they just you know so David's like you know I have I have dirt on you and Ephraim's like you have dirt on us and so regardless Henry I think he, he might have, might have punched Ephraim but regardless he just t just says fuck off and leaves the diner. So then, like, the next day, you have a scene where David is in the, his, they have nice apartments in Miami. Ever since their first deal, they've been, been pretty much balling, it looks like. But, and I don't really know if you're clamoring over 30 million bucks, you know, or two balling. But regardless, um, they're in this nice Miami penthouse, and David gets a call from a New York Times reporter, and they directly call him out, like, hey, we're looking into your, uh, Defense contract company AEY, and we want to talk about repackaging Chinese ammunition and selling them illegally to the Pentagon. And he's just like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Hangs up the phone, goes to the elevator with the wife and kid, and they're going to go to the beach or something or on a walk. And the elevator, as the elevator opens, Ephraim's in there. And so Ephraim's like all scared because the New York Times had called him as well. And so David and Ephraim are in the elevator together. Yeah, from tries to like again talk about Scarface, which is like a, a movie they referenced from the grade schooler when they were great friends. And David's like, You never been a great friend, you've just been like a hustler or whatever. And Ephraim's like, Yeah, I didn't watch Scarface last one night. <laughs> and so I just his character relationship like, was awesome. But regardless, they they go down and literally they're going from a pent like fifty two floors on a very nice uh, uh, Miami uh, hotel or residency, and once they get to the bottom floor, they open up the doors and there's the FBI ready to arrest them. And the FBI's like, well, that saved us a trip. And so they get arrested. And the sentencing, which was just mind-boggling, so the major themes is if you're a major drug arms dealer, Ephraim, they said he was, like, guilty or uh, convicted on, like, 40 federal charges and got four years. And David got, um, he pled guilty or something, I think in a plea deal, and got seven months house arrest. So it turns out you can sell a lot of fucking guns and ammunition and not do very much jail time. So I don't want to give you legal advice on that, but that just struck me as really low time for, 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 rather, for rather aggressive sales. I'm for all sales, but again, when you start a war as the fucking government, you're doing a little more illegal crimes, so it's like, ah, I don't know, it's a big, big shit hole. But regardless, that's, that's really kind of wraps up. 
And then so David, you have one more scene with Henry and Gerard. Um, Boshkin, Boshkin gets disappeared. It's not really clear as to why he would have not disappeared. But regardless, David has one more meeting with Henry in some, in some hotel room or whatever. And he's just asking him some questions like, you know, when you bumped into me at the, uh, in Las Vegas, was that next? And Henry's like, what do you think? So obviously implied no. And then David asks what happens to Boshkin. And Henry's like, you know, doesn't answer the question. Shows him a suitcase full of money, which is, I don't know, a couple hundred grand maybe. And he's like, here's some of my bit from the, the Afghan deal. And if, you know, no more questions. And so I, doesn't, I didn't really un understand as to why Boshkin would have been disappeared at all. But... Then you get some breakdown of, well, when they get arrested, you do get some breakdown that when, when uh, Ralph Slutsky had learned what's going on in terms of, first of all, getting cheapskated by Ephraim the entire time, and then what had happened with the ammunition and what they were really doing, he, he turned it as, as soon as he could. So Enver had called, when he didn't get his $100,000, he had called the Pentagon or the, the uh, American law enforcement, and then they arrested Ralph initially, and Ralph, once he learned what's going on, flipped. And so the meeting between Ephraim and David was really, uh, uh, Ralph had a wire on. So he had all of this voice admission of, you know, saying we forged all of these things, we sold all this, we repackaged this, you know, direct dead to rights <laughs> admissions. And so that, that happens before this final meeting, but that is the, fi the final scene is David gets a suitcase, so he gets a little bit of money from Henry Gerard at the end. So that is the end of the movie. Overall, I thought the comedy, the characterization, the historical accuracy, and the plot development and the actual production of the movie was fantastic. So overall, A, yeah, I didn't remember liking it this much, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it even on the second time through. Had seen this one before, didn't remember much of the plot. Thoroughly enjoyed this one. So thank you for watching another movie review of on Brad's Movie Review Series. Thank you for watching. I'll see you on the next one.